Think Forward. Think Research Channel. is that we're, we're searching here for texts that are lost and when we find them, we're finding more than images. We're finding texts that say things and those texts mean things. I love solving problems like that. I mean, that's why I get up in the morning is to solve those sorts of problems. A tool like the X-ray analysis would be just fabulous because there is so much hidden knowledge that would be just wonderful to come to life. Non-invasive technology is very important because you don't want to unroll rolls because they're very brittle and because they will turn into dust if you're trying to do that. Or you'll end up with just very few useless fragments, basically destroy the papyrus. I started thinking about virtual unwrapping by working with the British Library on some manuscripts that had pages that were wrinkled. And the problem of photographing wrinkled pages and then flattening them out using a virtual kind of technique seemed you know, very straightforward and we started to develop that and got good results. So in the library when we were scanning pages of books, there were some books that were so damaged that they really couldn't be opened. The pages were stuck together. And that did get me thinking about uh, the, the way things get damaged and how fragile they are. So I was thinking about newspapers crumpled, other kinds of things that were bound that couldn't be opened, these kinds of uh, geometries, arrangements of pages. And um, it led me to think about ancient documents, the, the classic of which is, is the scroll. And uh, thinking about how to open those was really how I, I came to begin to think about this project. I started to conceive of, of the idea that there may be things that just can't be opened. They're just too badly damaged, too fragile. And it turns out that there are many things like that, there, and there are schools exactly that way. We wanted to approach the problem systematically. So the first thing that I did was to take a piece of canvas that we could control and I, I put some ink on it and rolled it up and then we took it to a conventional CT scanner at the hospital. And that was really our very first test. We scanned it as you would a patient and got the data and took a look at it. That first example was successful. But what I realized from that was that um, the medical kind of scanner is tuned to the wrong thing for this kind of problem. It doesn't have the resolution that you need. In other words, you can't see the detail because you don't need that kind of resolution for healthcare kinds of problems. It also didn't have the uh, ability to bring out finer detail in terms of the brightness of the text. And so I knew then that we'd have to build some kind of a custom device to do this kind of scanning we wanted to do. Dr. Joe Gray is a specialist in x-ray. He's a physicist and works almost exclusively with um, methods for non-destructive evaluation. And in fact, he's one of the, the central faculty at the Center for Non-Destructive Evaluation at Iowa State University. His work has been central to what we want to do because he can help us design a custom scanner that looks inside of these things without unwrapping them and can be tuned to exactly the right settings to see what we need to be able to see. The computer tomography scanners that, that are used are almost always custom designed for the particular application. What we do at the center 
for non-structure evaluation in terms of, of our equipment is we try to anticipate that we're going to be asked to do all kinds of different things. And so what I try to have in the capability is flexibility. So my systems aren't designed and optimized for any one type of system. So you can sort of imagine that this three-dimensional CT scan has broken the object up into a bunch of little Lego blocks. And each Lego block may have a thing that says, well, this is an air Lego block, and this is a paper Lego block, and this is a, an ink Lego block, and then this is a sand grain Lego block or whatever. And of course, you may get inner ones that are part of one and part in another and so on. The point is, is that they're in a regular grid. And when you're viewing some of these 3D grids, at least with the software as we have it right now, we basically move through a, a plane of, of those Lego blocks, sort of this way or maybe this way and so on. So it's very important that you not just stop <coughs> with the CT data and examining the CT data as we are sort of customarily used to doing. You need to, to have something that can take that complex contour and map it into a flat plane so that you can actually get a good, accurate representation of the, of the data that's there. The next sample that I constructed was, again, something controlled, but that would bring us nearer to the kinds of real things that we would like to work with. And so I took some papyrus and had an artist write in, um, in ink that was similar to the kind of ink that would be used in the period, uh, some messages, and then I rolled the papyrus up. And in order to handle the sample easily, I, I fixed that inside a, um, a polyurethane uh, clear fixture, sphere, and that made it easy to transport and to handle and to look at, but uh, created the, the problem that you can't read the text and the rolled up wraps. And we used that as our second experiment. The scanning process uses x-rays that penetrate and create a set of cross sections one at a time. The cross-sectional slices taken together give a three-dimensional volumetric look through all the layers of the object. This is similar to medical scans, but we use a carefully tuned custom scanner that gives much better resolution and is tuned to see the ink and the papyrus rather than flesh and bone. The resolution is so high that we can see five samples within the thickness of the papyrus, which is just one-tenth of one millimeter thick. You can see the outer circle of the plastic ball in the scan. Inside, the rolled papyrus appears, slice by slice. When the scanner picks up the ink, it causes bright hot spots in the slices. The slices from the scanner give us all the information we need to read the scroll. Each wrap of the papyrus has clear writing on it. The problem is that we cannot read it because it is rolled up. We will make the page readable by virtually unrolling it. This simulation shows the surface of the papyrus unrolling over time. The top edge is held firm while the rest of the surface drops under a simulated gravitational force. The texture on the surface comes from its original position in the volumetric scan. We model this process as a particle system and the connections between particles are modeled as springs. The software forces the virtual particles and springs to obey real physical principles. As the surface unrolls, it reveals the readable text on the inner layers. A user can interactively control all aspects of the virtual unrolling simulation. The gravity force encourages the surface to unroll until we are ready to turn and flatten the open text into a two-dimensional readable page. A direct comparison with the images of the original shows the quality of the result. We created this image of the text using software for virtual unrolling and the data from the volumetric scan. You can see how close our result is to the original untouched scroll. So at that point we, we talked to the University of Michigan's uh, staff through uh, the help of, of Professor Richard Jenko who is the, uh, the chair of the classics department there and he helped us uh, secure an object from their collection that could be transported to Iowa so that we could do the scanning. Binding was interesting because it, it's not rolled up. It's a binding made from layers that are stuck together. One layer was visible already, but what we didn't know when we got the sample was what, if any, 
text there would be down in the uh, middle layers? The section of the manuscript that we are looking at um, for the Hebrew fragment is, in fact, this section of the binding right here. Uh, the edge of the binding, we can see where the thongs have been laced in, and it stops just beyond that point right about here. Ideas of uh, solid waste management and uh, recycling, it's really kind of an old idea for people who make books. There was a, a practice called remboitage, in which case uh, an old binding would be put onto a newer book. So you might uh, disassemble a book and find that you had a very old binding on a book that was not as old as the binding. Uh, yes, people sometimes comment uh, in an art gallery that they like the picture frame better than they like the painting. And this can be true of books as well, so that uh, occasionally you'll find a binding that's more fascinating than the book that it covers. This photograph is clearly a picture of Hebrew. These are the Hebrew letters. There's nothing surprising about them. It's written in the standard biblical style, the, the handwriting, the font, which is used for, for writing the Bible. So here, the word chromim, and here, the word chromim. The next word is osisi, and it's got the ayin. Here is the three-pronged sin, which is this one here. And then two short letters surrounded surrounding a bigger letter. Here's the short one, here's the short one, here's the bigger one that it surrounds. When I first saw this, it was immediately clear to me that this had to be Ecclesiastes because of the combination of thoughts that I see here. Here I see the word kramim, meaning vineyards. Here I have asisili, I made for myself. That's in the first person. There's not a lot of the Bible which is in the first person. And so the combination I made for myself, and vineyards, really makes it look like Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is a book that belongs to the wisdom literature in the Old Testament, so it finds itself in the earlier books, originally written in Hebrew, and comes to us uh, from the ancient texts of the wisdom literature at the time when Israel was still a nation before its destruction in 587. The book of Ecclesiastes aims to show the vanity of created goods in relation to God who is the highest good. It was really interesting for me personally because I've been interested for a while in biblical scholarship that uh, that verse touched on uh, people and what they do for a living and their career. Um, and this project has been a, a large part of my career for the last five years and so um, I thought it was just fascinating and uh, an interesting commentary to uh, find that the text, you know, had relevance in my own life. And, and I have a feeling that that is going to be a broader theme, not just for me, but for other people. The idea is that we're, we're searching here for texts that are lost. And when we find them, we're finding more than images. We're finding texts that say things and those texts mean things. And I think that's really interesting. We first visually looked at the, the book binding. The present, the surface that presented it to us was a very flat, smooth surface with very clear writing on it. On the opposite side, there was a, a modeled, uh, aged leather binding or leather strip from the back of the book. What wasn't clear and what you sort of didn't realize until you looked at the x-ray images was that what you suspect that there's a set of nice smooth layers similar to that top layer underneath, that that wasn't the case. What ended up happening was that there's a lot of chopped pieces in there, the, the material goes through a series of waves and, and breaks and, and so on, and so the, the details of the inside part are much, much more complex than, than I initially thought just by visually looking at the sample. Um, the first thing that became apparent was you could see various types of, of features in the, in the data. Um, one of them was a wormhole. Uh, I finally understand what people mean when they say bookworm. Uh, it's not somebody with glasses that reads too many books, it's actually a worm that eats your books. Um, the second thing that became apparent is that book bindings there today, that are basically pages stuck into a bit of glue and another piece of paper glued on top, are not the book bindings that people made 500 years ago or more. 
So the first initial reaction of, of this whole setup is that we have a, a much more complex structure than what we're looking at. And we're getting that both from the radiographs and especially from the CT. The interpretation of those two-dimensional images can be somewhat, sometimes difficult, particularly if there's a lot of complexity in the, in the internal structure of the object. Um, we're, just, we're used to looking at three-dimensional worlds, not collapsed two-dimensional worlds. And what we were starting to see is some indications that look suggestive. And I don't want to oversell this particularly, but when you see, um, see that Hebrew is, is written with square sorts of characters and in a linear sort of fashion, and you see a row of square sort of characters in a linear fashion, it makes, it, it makes you get, hmm, hey, we might be seeing something here. So in the, in the initial view of the data, which you kind of do as you take data, you want to look at it to see, you know, should you tailor what you're doing. Uh, we've certainly seen some tantalizing, some tantalizing results, and that's always very encouraging. Dr. Seals showed me another text from inside and said, does this look like anything? This is what I recognized. The word vodaas and knowledge. And this comes from the same chapter, verse 26. Uh, and the particular text uh, is, uh, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. I lined this up so that the line right above and the line right below looked uh, pretty much like what I was seeing. It was a very small snippet, and so it was hard to be sure, but the word vodaas was pretty clear. That was my analysis that I was able to see. What we were looking for in the x-ray was, was clear evidence that the text was there. And then we wanted to be able to just confirm that to complete the loop in this experiment. That's something we're not going to be able to do ultimately with the scrolls that we'd like to scan. But um, University of Michigan was so kind as to let us work with this sample because while it's important, um, they understood how important this project was to be able to do that confirmation. So we were able to, with a conservator, take that step and take the layers apart. Lila, as a conservator, uh, was extremely helpful in doing the scanning. I don't think it would be possible to do th this kind of work with anyone less experienced. I mean, it, it was her hand that allowed that, that to happen. I was asked if I could separate these layers just to verify uh, the images, compare the images uh, from their project to the original. I decided to take off first the leather cover at this point, then I turned it around, walked from the other side, got the first layer off. Also, this was extremely difficult because also the layers are fused together for a long, long time. And I hate to destroy anything. And since these are manuscripts, scraps but still manuscripts. I made sure with our paparologist Trianas Gargos and also with the head of conservation Shannon Zachary that if something gets destroyed it's gonna be okay. <laughs> I started separating and of course I took some layers off from lower pages to the upper page on the back side. Um, at some point then I did some humidification I got some more layers off from the backside, and then at some point, discussing with our paper conservator, Cassie Baker, Shannon decided to emerge the entire page because there was still one part of a layer, shaved part of the layer on the other side. So I uh, merged the uh, page into the water. After a while, I removed it out of the water bath and could very nicely remove the last layer. I'm very intrigued by the technology of book structure. So to see all of that sort of come, come apart um, so that you get back closer and closer and closer to the person who, who used that material in the first place and, and pasted it all together into a pasteboard is, I find that very exciting. So we, we are very much interested in all forms of technology exactly because we try to uh, solve all sorts of problems that come with these manuscripts. And there's a whole range of problems. The worst 
of course, is that you can't unroll the engine rolls. Okay. And then trying to put the fragments in proper order and finally reading them and producing text. The possibility for us to read this text without opening, quote, in some point, destroying some uh, paper, some images, some ink, would be fabulous. You don't want to be taking bindings apart in order to see the manuscripts in them. Uh, if you have scrolls or other things, um, destroying them in the past has sometimes been the only way to get at the manuscript that is in the interior, and you're destroying you're destroying part of the context and the history of the item to get to that interior. Having to, to deal with these uh, layers and trying to figure out a way of separating them with and minimize the loss or damage to the piece. Um, I love solving problems like that. I mean, that's why I get up in the morning, is to solve those sorts of problems. As a conservator, we tried to save um, everything. and. It was very, very difficult, very tricky, and also in some part, I lost some writings from some sites. This I don't like very much, so it's, it's just very hard to lose some images. But in this case, there was no other choice for me. We pretty well spent the entire day separating out maybe three layers uh, at most of a fragment of board that has at least six and probably closer to 10 or 12 layers. If I would work full time to separate any of these, some of these scrolls, I couldn't finish them in my lifetime. There are so many. So also for this reason, a tool like the X-ray analysis would be just fabulous because there is so much hidden knowledge that would be just wonderful to come to life. So there's this wrinkled page and I can flatten it. What if the page were completely wadded up like a piece of newspaper? Could I flatten that? And that was the way my thinking went and when I convinced myself I could it was only then that I started to realize that there may be actual materials out there that could benefit from that kind of an approach. I just think that's interesting because um, there were other people who were already thinking about the materials and then we kind of met. We kind of met and uh, have been going on from there. The flattening of individual pages that was the genesis of the full unwrapping problem um, is something that we've continued to do and in fact we recently were able to apply those techniques to the uh, Venetus A manuscript, which is housed in the Marciana Library in Venice. The Venetus A is one of the oldest complete copies of uh, Homer's Iliad. And uh, it, was, it was really satisfying to be able to apply that to so high profile a manuscript, so important a manuscript. But um, we were able to go ahead and scan each of those pages and have the opportunity to virtually flatten them as part of a, a broader project by the Center for Hellenic Studies in Washington, D.C. The next thing we'd like to do is a, an object that is completely rolled up. Many examples of that came from ancient Egypt in the form of Books of the Dead. Uh, it's very dry there, so they survived. And in fact, there is one Book of the Dead, believed to be Book of the Dead, that's, that's rolled up in its original form and is stored, archived at the uh, British Museum. And next summer we'll be going to the museum to scan that Book of the Dead uh, to confirm what it is and to virtually unwrap that text. It's going to be a text that won't be opened because the goal is to preserve the original form factor of what these things look like. So we believe our techniques as they've been developed now will uh, immediately be able to be applied and we'll, we'll see the text. So that, that's the next step in the progression. Following that is what I consider to be the grand challenge, and that is the opening of the Herculaneum papyri. Um, these are probably the most difficult papyri to read, and the reason is twofold. One, they've been carbonized, which means that the papyrus has been um, essentially burned, but not completely consumed. So they're extremely fragile and the color's been changed, but the text is still there. It just adds an extra dimension to the challenge. 
The second thing is that the kind of ink that was used for those papyri was not metal-based ink, and that presents a real challenge for the x-ray technique, which we've been working on. And so if we can solve both of those problems, then we'll be able to solve this grand challenge problem, and there are several hundred of these manuscripts as yet to be opened. The scope of the project really was conceived to address those Herculaneum papyri in the end. And what we've been doing is systematically moving in that direction so that when the time comes, we'll be able to scan them and read them um, without any doubt. And what's happened is that a lot of things have fallen into place from the beginning where I was only thinking about the project geometrically to the point now where we have a relationship with um, scholars at the Sorbonne and we'll have real authentic Herculaneum materials on loan. You can't really explain all of those things, I think, as pure coincidence. I mean, I really think that providentially a lot of things have happened in this project uh, to help it along. You know, and I'm, I'm just really excited by that. Um, that, that seeing that happening, you know, has, has, uh, has been exciting and interesting. And uh, we'll see where it goes. Hard to say. You have a tension against wanting to read the text and wanting to preserve the artifact itself. And if there is a way to read the text without destroying the artifact, this means having your cake and eating it too. It's quite the dream of any scholar to preserve all of the parts and still get all the information out of it. There is no way you can physically undo the rolls. So that's where we need to find technologies that will not damage the roll, the papyri. We do a lot of different projects at the center. So every now and again, you, you, know, you do a lot of applied work and you do work that, that <clears throat> has very good practical applications. Everybody nods their head and says, yes, safe airplanes, that's a good thing. But every now and again, you have to do something to remember where you're coming from. And that's what these scrolls are. The thing that occurred to me when I read the text was that, um, you know, this life is all too transient and uh, you know, much like the x-ray that passes through, through the text itself, you know, that gives us so faint an image, right? Um, the things in this life that we do, we eat, we drink, we work, they have meaning, but they pass very quickly, so you have to take the opportunities and do the best you can, you know. And it was a, a strong reminder of that again.